Hello everyone and welcome back to I'm Not the Book Expert, but she is, and I am Rachel, your first not expert. <laughs> you couldn't have picked like any like more complicated <laughs> way to say that, could you? <laughs> no, I really couldn't. <laughs> well, I'm Maggie, and I am the expert and the second host, and I could probably come up with more titles if you gave me um a uh, further further notice. No. Um, advanced notice. There we go. Or additional time. Additional time, but we don't have additional time. Additional time is something that we are often in short supply of. Very, very correct. <laughs> yes. So, Rachel, what are we talking about today? We are talking about book four of the Percy Jackson and the Olympian series, which is the Battle of the Labyrinth. And we are are really excited for it. I did finish this book. Maggie did not have faith in me to finish before our recording. Okay. She hadn't started yet as of the recording. And to in my defense, she hadn't started yet until like yesterday. And so I was like, Rachel, are you sure about this? Because it took me um, like a month and a half to read this. And that's because I had some other stuff going on. So, But I'm not saying that as an excuse. I'm just saying it took me a long time to read this for some reason. And I was like, Rachel... Are you sure about this? But she did and, it and she succeeded. And I, I pretty much said, you want to bet? To which... I did not uh, want to bet. Maggie did not want to bet. And neither did my student who also lost the bet to me about the number of books I'd read. He has now vowed to never make another bet with me. So like... Hey, yeah. he learned his lesson. He did. And if he's listening right now, I will expect a wager for this coming like new year. <laughs> We don't have to wager anything, but like, I want there to be, a, I want, I want to see what you think I won't do. You work well under pressure. I do. I do. <laughs> it's the n- neurodivergent side of me. Mm. Yeah. It, 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 it makes you um very um demigodish, I would almost say. What? <laughs> I know. So shocking. So Maggie, also, before we get, oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I feel like some fun little trivia for our listeners. Um, Rachel and I are actually currently in the same building. We are. In two I separate am, rooms. <laughs> I am upstairs in my husband's office and Maggie's actually in my normal recording room, just in a different yeah, area um, of the room. Rachel trapped me in her basement and I can't leave. Okay, you're here for Thanksgiving. I don't want to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so you shouldn't have said Thanksgiving because now when we release this like eight months from now, <laughs> it's gonna everyone's gonna <laughs> think it's really out of date. You shouldn't have said that. Um, I don't really care. <laughs> okay. And also, we have a scheduled release date, and I think we are going to stick to it this time. Fingers crossed. <laughs> Knock on wood. Knock on wood. I I am at a wooden desk. I'll just, uh, there we Perfect. go. Perfect. So Maggie, what have you been reading as of recently? Um, well, we've both been reading a lot since it's been a little while since we last recorded. I think it's been like since August or September. Yeah, probably September, like beginning of September. Yeah, because I think I just started teaching. Yeah, so... It's been a while, so I was like, okay, I'll just pick, like, my best five, because I've read some mediocre books here and there. Let's just talk about the ones that I really enjoyed. Mm -hmm. Um, I really liked The Book of Living Secrets by Madeline Rue. Um, That was a recommendation from Rachel. I listened to it on a drive home from somewhere. I was actually, when did I listen to that? Oh, I listened to that at the beginning of October. So, yeah, that was my little road trip that I took. Um. I read the graphic novel um, Displacement by Kiku Hughes, um, which was very good. Um, In a similar vein, I also read They Called Us Enemy by George Takei. Um, Both of those are like, both of those are graphic novels. Um, They Called Us Enemy is a memoir um, Mm -hmm. about um, uh, his experience um, in Japanese internment camps during World War II. Um, And Displacement is sort of a historical not I don't want to call it historical fiction because it's very rooted in reality and the experiences of the author's grandmother yeah um 
but it is also has sort of a fantasy element where the author who is also the main character finds herself displaced in time experiencing mm-hmm. things alongside her grandmother so those were both very good i would certainly recommend them i also read um, another graphic novel called invisible differences by julie dache and mademoiselle caroline um, that is a graphic novel that was translated from french into english and it's about um it, that one's also a memoir about the author um her experience in um sort of realizing that she is on the autism spectrum and finding support and learning how to advocate for herself and getting the support that she needs, um, especially in the, in France where she lives, where um, autism is, I don't want to say it's unheard of because it certainly exists, but it's not as broadly talked about as even it is in the United States where we still don't really broadly talk about it Mm -hmm. at all. So that was really good. Um, I would certainly recommend that as well. Um, And I read The Best We Could Do by T. Bui. I was really on a graphic novel streak for a while here. Apparently. (laughs) Um, And a lot of them are memoirs or like nonfiction. So this was another um, nonfiction memoir. Um, Very good. Certainly would recommend it. And finally, I read Gallant by V.E. Schwab, which is not a graphic novel, although it does have illustrations, which I did not find out about until after I finished listening to the audiobook. (laughs) Um, I feel that was good. It was a good V.E. Schwab book. If you like V.E. Schwab, it's worth reading. I don't know if I'd call it her best, like, because Vicious is still, like, top tier for me. Um, yeah. But I did still really enjoy it, and it was a nice, um, quick listen. Those all sound fantastic. Well, thank you. I picked them out myself. What? Actually, I, I told you to read the Book of Living Secrets, so. Okay. <laughs> Rachel, what did you read recently? So my like top five from the last time we recorded are part of my top 10, I should say. Um, I read All the Living and the Dead by Haley Campbell, which was really good. It's about the death industry and the people that work in the death industry. And it, it, I, I have read a lot of books about death, like very objectively. This is how American culture takes care of they're dead. This is how a bunch of different cultures across the world take care of the dead. And this one was really interesting to see how vastly different people from the same culture can treat bodies or the process of dying. So it was a really Mm. cool kind of look at the death industry. And it's actually one of the Goodreads Choice Award nominees this year, which I was really excited to see. That's actually why I picked it up and read it. And I really loved the audiobook because I listened to it as an audiobook. So I, I I loved it. <laughs> Are we surprised? No. No, um, we're not. But at one point there was fine. a story about goldfish, not the snack, but the actual like animal. And it made me so emotional that I had to send Maggie a voice message at like seven o'clock in the morning and I was like, I can't handle this. <laughs> I was, was really in bed. <laughs> <laughs> ten out of ten would recommend. I also listened to How to Survive Your Murder by Danielle Valentine which I was not expecting to like. I was expecting for it to be all right. And then I read it and I was like, oh no, this is a comfort read, which honestly, very surprising. Didn't know that was going to happen. But I would also recommend that one. If you like psychological thriller type books, I would put that in this category. I also read the Wayward Children series, books one through five by Seanan McGuire. That was a Maggie, like, telling me to read it and it was already on my tbr so thank you maggie for pushing me to read it yeah rachel finally read one of my recommendations i'm so excited you say that like i've never picked up one of your recommendations before it it doesn't happen as often as sometimes i would like it to but that's just me being selfish what other books do you want me to read all of them (laughs) (laughs) i need you to be more specific You're putting a lot of pressure on me in this moment. Okay, well, send me a list later, okay? Okay. Okay. I will hand deliver you a list later, actually. fan flippin I'm so excited. (laughs) (laughs) I know you are. Tell us about Wayward Children, Rachel. So Wayward Children, uh, I think the way that the author describes it or the blurb is like, 
what happened to Susan from Narnia and Alice from Alice in Wonderland after their adventures. And essentially it's this like group of school children and you not school children, they're like high schoolers and you are watching them kind of rediscover life and going on these adventures and all these things. And I absolutely love it. My favorite character is named Christopher. I love him. He's a sweetheart. They're Mm -hmm. all idiots and it's so great. I love them. (laughs) Yeah. So if you like like portal fantasy type stories and you just always wondered what happens to the characters after that. Well, here you go. Yes. And I am particularly partial to like book one, three and five, I would say with four Mm -hmm. being slightly thereafter. And then two, I think might be my lowest of those first five. Really? Yeah. I really do not like the one character and I'm not, I'm intentionally not saying their name because it's a bit of a spoiler. I got you. Uh, But I know who you mean though. (laughs) I think Maggie and I would agree that like, we both really like these books and Maggie's going to talk about her feelings about it later. Cause I think you have it on the, the next day. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I also read The X-Hex and The Kiss Curse by Aaron Sterling. Great romances. Would recommend if you are 18 plus. It does have some spice to it. Stuff. (laughs) Um, And finally, I read the second book in the Amari series. So Amari and the Great Game by B.B. Alston. Also 10 out of 10 would recommend. It was a good time. You've read so many good books. I have been waiting to read Amari and the Great Game, and um, I'm going to see if my library has the audiobook of it, because I really enjoyed the audio of the first book. I really liked this audiobook, too. So, Maggie... Well, we have, we have a lot of news to catch up on. Yes. <laughs> and I decided to split it up. Um, we're going to talk about some Rick Riordan book news um, in this episode, and then in part two, we'll talk more about the Percy Jackson TV show news. So we'll have a little bit more to update you on there. Um, I did want to quick run through some of the um, uh, Rick Riordan presents news and sort of the authors that fall under that imprint. Um, So really the big one is um, Rick Riordan presents author Kwame Mbalia has a new imprint with Disney books called Freedom Fire. Um, According to Publishers Weekly, um, they, they say, and I'm quoting them here, Um, The imprint will feature stories of Black resilience and Black joy written by Black creators and is tentatively scheduled to to debut in spring 2024. So that's really cool to see, like, this author who got his start, like, writing under this imprint is now getting to start his own imprint to feature um, more creators and things like that. I think that's really awesome. Mm -hmm. It it is awesome because there are not enough Black voices that are published popular and portray black joy in Mm -hmm. current popular book communities exactly Exactly. they are out there they are just harder to find i want to clarify Mm -hmm. yeah rachel do you want to take this next bullet point i would love to as this is a bunch of go ahead as of right now the book that i have been waiting for since march of this year Sirwa Botang's Guide to Vampire Hunting by Roseanne A. Brown is officially released. Ah! I'm a little I'm excited. excited. <laughs> hey, um, it's very exciting. And tangentially related, and I think Maggie knows where I'm going with this. Mm-hmm. Uh, I got to meet up with Maggie in a local Barnes & Noble where Rosie and another author, Bethany C. Morrow, were signing books. And I got Rosie to sign my copy of Vampire Hunting. Plus, I got her to re-sign my two other books by her. And she signed on a random page. It was absolutely genius. She signed on a random page and then drew a picture of her characters. It was fantastic. They were delightful people. And I was so glad we got to meet them. For sure. And they, they like, actually talked to us. It wasn't like, mm-hmm. okay, I'm going to sign your book and then walk you away. Like, yeah. no, like they, they talked to us. We got pictures. Uh, Rosie remembered me from an event like I had to remind her who I was obviously because I'm not that special but like once she got that reminder she knew who I was yeah that was a really fun day it was such a great day 
And then just some other um, Rick Riordan Presents titles that are either out now, coming out soon, or have been announced. Um, we have Lords of Night by J.C. Cervantes. Um, Winston Chu versus the Whimsies by Stacey Lee. That comes out in February 2023. Um, Fury of the Dragon Goddess by Sarwat Chada. That's in August of 2023. And then The Spirit Glass by Roshni Chokshi. Um, that has just been announced. We don't know when it's coming out yet. But those are all some books that are on the horizon for that imprint. So if you've got a middle grade reader in your life, or if you just enjoy um, Rick Riordan presents or books like Percy Jackson, mm-hmm. there's your reading list for the next couple of months. <laughs> However, Maggie, do you know what I am probably the most excited for? Is it The Sun and the Star? It is The Sun and the Star. (sighs) Okay, so if you don't know The Sun and the Star yet, um, it is the title that was recently announced um, Mm -hmm. for the Nico and Will book, which is what we've all been calling it until the title was announced um, not too long ago. So we got the title, which is The Sun and the The Star. The Sun and the Star. The release date, which is May 2nd, 2023, just in time for Maggie's birthday. We got the cover art and we got a blurb. So we know a little bit about what the book is about. And I'm both stressed out and very excited. And the cover art is absolutely gorgeous. Like, I cannot wait to have it in my hands. Except I know. Here's, here's my failing. And I already confessed this to Maggie. Not that I had to confess mm-hmm. it because she already knew. Uh, I am going to have to finish the Percy Jackson series, which I've already done. So like, I don't have to do it, but I, I have one book left. It's fine. Mm -hmm. But then I have to read all of Heroes of Olympus for the first time. Correct. And I have to read all of the Trials of Apollo for the first time. Correct. I also want to read uh, the Magnus Chase series, but I don't think that I need to read that to read The Sun and the Star. No. Um... I, I don't think she, I, Rachel seems very worried. I don't think she has anything to worry about because you get those audiobooks going and you can run through those like so quick. Yes. That's how I listened library, to the Trials of Apollo. My library doesn't have all of them. Well, and if they do, I don't it's know like what a to tell you that. 30 week wait. Well, start putting them on hold. I have. I can only put 10 books at a time on hold. I don't know what to tell you then. It sucks. I don't like it. You do have these books. They are on your shelf. I know. that. I'm not complaining about that part because I, I do own <laughs> all of them, except I don't own all of the Trials of Apollo yet. You have at least the first one or two, right? I think I have the first two or I have one in three. <laughs> I would get I up have... and go look at your bookshelf, but I'm kind of lazy. I was not expecting you to, so. I mean, I would if you asked, but I don't think you're asking. I I am not asking you to do that. Yeah. Oh, good. Glad we're on the (laughs) same page here. Um, So we'll we'll link to some stuff in the description below if you missed the announcement and missed the entire Percy Jackson fandom, like, exploding about this book. Um, I literally stopped class when I, A, when I saw that it was announced, B, when the uh, title released, and see when the cover was was revealed. I would I would I literally had like notifications on for when this stuff was announced, and I would stop class and I'd be like, "Oh my gosh, y'all!" And then th- we would talk about it for like two minutes, and then we'd go back to our work. So shout out to my students who were really nice about my obsessions. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah, and like I would try to describe the cover to you, but. Nothing I say will do it justice. It is phenomenal. And Agreed. I'm just really excited to see what um, Rick Riordan and Marco Shiro have concocted. And I'm also a little bit nervous, but we hope nothing terrible permanent happens. Nothing permanently terrible happens. Knowing Marco Shiro and what he has written and having heard him talk. Mm-hmm. I have faith in in the protection of our characters good that makes me feel better Uh, not that i doubted them just (laughs) but but rick does have a tendency to kill off characters i don't think that's going to happen i'm manifesting it i don't like using that word but i'm going to manifest it here we're not going to kill any characters i 
definitely do not think we are going to lose either of the title characters. Brilliant. So, but Maggie, would you like to talk about the next book? (laughs) I just about lost my mind. Listeners, we have an all new Percy Jackson adventure coming to bookstores everywhere on September 26th, 2023. Percy Jackson and the Chalice of the Gods. It will feature the original trio. So we will have Percy, Percy, Grover, and Annabeth back together. (laughs) And the premise is that poor Percy Jackson is trying real hard to get into the University of New Rome. And they've said, by the way, you need recommendation letters from some gods. And of course, in order to get these recommendation letters, Percy has to do favors for the gods. So he is going to find this chalice and there's a quest and it should be good it will be good um rick says as of um i think it was like the middle of october he's working on the second draft of the manuscript so it's moving right along and i am just very excited that is definitely going to be a book that i am going to pre-order oh yeah and If I am not up to date on all of the reading, I might skip some of it just to read that book because I feel like I know enough about books to be able to do that. Technically, this takes place before the Trials of Apollo. So you could, if as long as you read up through Heroes of Olympus, you should be set. Fantastic. Plan done. There we go. So that's about it for Rick Riordan and Rick Riordan adjacent book news um again we'll talk more about the tv show news in our next episode correct and if if it wasn't like plain plainfully plainfully honest plainfully 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 honest obvious yes we are super excited about all of these books like yes we are probably more excited for the books that contain percy and the books that contain characters from the percy jackson series but we are excited for all of the Rick Riordan Presents books because they do provide a wider range of voices that we are really excited to hear. Absolutely. 100%. So Maggie, are you ready for our discussion? I surely am. Uh, We're kind of doing things a little bit differently. So in our past couple of books, we've sort of talked about the books as we've gone through them. And I've decided that's taken us way too long. (laughs) That, I would say that's a bit from my prompting of like, oh my gosh, we have enough for like four episodes here and I narrow yeah. it down to three and even that's pushing mm-hmm. it sometimes. Yeah, that is pushing it. So we're going to give you a summary of the first, roughly the first half of Battle of the Labyrinth. It's the first 11 chapters. We're going to run through that with some details and then we'll kind of talk about sort of our analysis from this half of the book. Mm-hmm. Um, But before we do that, I'm actually going to put things a little bit out of order. I do want to go over some content warnings quick before we get into the summary. Um, So just so you all are aware, um, this Battle of the Labyrinth contains um, ableism, death, depression, fire, grief, loss of loved ones, manipulation, PTSD, sexism, skeletons, Um, Suicide is mentioned, and there's also torture, violence, and themes of war. So just be conscious of those content warnings as we go into this discussion, because they will likely come up in conversation as well. Mm -hmm. So Rachel, would you like to start us off with the summary? I would love to. Percy Jackson is determined to make it through the upcoming school year, especially since Sally's boyfriend, Paul, teaches at Percy's new school. Unfortunately for for Percy, unfortunately for Percy, that isn't going to happen. Not only does Percy meet Rachel Dare, a mortar girl he never thought he'd see again, but he's also attacked by several imposa disguised as school cheerleaders. As Percy narrowly escapes the chaos, he runs into Annabeth and the two make their way to Camp Half-Blood. Things at camp are tense. Not only is there a new combat instructor, Quintus, with his pet hellhound, Mrs. O'Leary, but Grover has also been given a tight deadline in his search for Pan. 
Things start looking up when Percy's brother Tyson arrives at camp, but Percy is still plagued by dreams of his enemy Luke and the wayward demigod Nico D'Angelo. Annabeth believes that Luke's forces are going to try to use Daedalus's ancient labyrinth, now large enough to cover the entire United States, to attack Camp Half-Blood, but without knowing where the entrance to the labyrinth is, there's little that they can do to prepare. During a combat exercise at camp, however, Percy and Annabeth stumble into one of the labyrinth's entrances. Soon after, Annabeth is given a quest to enter the labyrinth, find Daedalus, and convince him to stop Luke's forces from attacking camp. She chooses Percy, Grover, and Tyson to join her. Things start off well. The team meets the gods Janus and Hera, the latter of whom offers some hem- hemi-selfful. So- <laughs> hemi-selfful? <laughs> yep. The latter of whom offers some semi-helpful advice and snacks. The snacks are important. Obviously. From there, things start going downhill. Our heroes arrive on Alcatraz Island, where the ancient monster Kempi is wreaking havoc. They narrowly escape, but Tyson rescues Briares, the last hundred-handed one in the process. Next, they arrive at Triple G Ranch, run by Garion and Yuri Tyon. Nico is there too, and he has a bone to pick with Percy. Garion's hospitality soon turns sour, though, and Percy has to clean a stable of man-eating horses in order to free his friends. After succeeding and defeating Garion, Percy and Nico summon Bianca's spirit together. Bianca offers some good advice to her brother, but Nico is still unsure of what he's going to do next. Finally, back in the labyrinth again, the heroes are guided by a mechanical spider who is leading them to the workshop of the god Hephaestus. Along the way, they encounter the Sphinx, who nearly kills them all after Annabeth refuses to take a standardized test. When the gang meets Hephaestus, he agrees to help them, but in return, they must investigate disturbances at Mount St. Helens, one of the gods' old workshops. The four heroes plan to go together, but when Grover senses the presence of Pan, they split up. Grover and Tyson seek out Pan, while Percy and Annabeth follow the mechanical spider to Mount St. Helens. When they arrive, the place is overrun with Telkines, sea demons, forging weapons of Kronos' army. Percy and Annabeth split up, so Annabeth is able to escape, but Percy is soon surrounded. With no other options, Percy summons all of his power to the volcano, causing it to erupt and send him flying. And that's where chapter 11 ends, so we're really ending on a cliffhanger today guys uh blame it on rick blame it on rick honestly a lot of his chapters do seem to end with um cliffhanger moments oh for sure almost as a general rule i very rarely stop at chapter ends excuse me i very rarely stop at chapter ends oh i always stop at chapter ends or like chap like breaks in the chapter i'll do i'll do Um, breaks in the chapter uh, so I try to stop at chapter ends, though, because otherwise it, I, I, I'm i stressed out. I, I don't know why. I stop once I have an answer. So, like, mm. if I if I want to stop at the end of a chapter, sometimes I will read the next page of the next chapter just to make sure that everything's okay. <laughs> That's valid. Or to, like, know what's going to happen next. That is perfectly valid. I will say sometimes I do skim the next page. So let's let's start with Percy. I want to talk a little bit about Percy. Um, I mean, we've said most of our like main stuff about Percy, and like we know who he is at this point. We've we've read three books, like we've got a pretty solid understanding of him. But mm-hmm. one of the things I noticed about him in this book is right before he goes on the quest with Annabeth, Quintus approaches him and he's like, hey, here, have this Stygian ice whistle. Um, If you use it, it will melt after it's one use. So, like, make sure it counts. To bring Mrs. O'Leary the hellhound to him. Does he tell Percy that? I couldn't remember off the top of my head. Okay. Well, Well, he tells him that it can only be used once. Right. So Percy's like, okay, but like in his narration, he's like, I don't think I'm ever going to use this. Like Luke was my friend and he gave me a gift and it nearly dragged me into Tartarus. Mm -hmm. So maybe just not. And I thought it was interesting that we saw some of the, we don't see it as much with Percy, these residual effects of like how Luke's betrayal hurt him and has affected his relationships We see it a lot with Annabeth, right? Yeah. Because she and Luke were obviously much closer. Like, they'd known each other for longer and all of that. 
Um, mm-hmm. But like Percy was affected too. Like Luke was one of his first friends, his first real mentor at camp. And then he was betrayed by him. Mm-hmm. So I think it's interesting that Percy's like, hmm, you're acting like you're my friend, but the last time someone acted like my friend and then gave me a gift right before I went on a quest, I nearly died. So, like, maybe, maybe not. Yeah, and I would say that Luke was one of Percy's, like, first friends, period. Like, other than Grover, Luke was the first person that he, like, felt comfortable with. And then Luke was like, haha, nope, peace, bye. Mm -hmm. Kill you later. That's gotta be, yeah. That's got to be traumatic for a 12-year-old. Oh, for sure. It's traumatic for a 26-year-old. I mean, yes, but it's traumatic for anyone of any age. But, like, mm-hmm. especially when you're not even, you're, you're you're barely a teenager. Right. You're still figuring out who you are, and you're trying to establish relationships with other people outside of your family. And mm-hmm. one of the first times you feel like you really connect with someone, it's just like, nope, psych, I actually want you dead. Correct. Like, Ouch. In a bit of a spoiler, but not really, I really like Quintus. Yes. And I, I think we'll save a lot of our discussion about him for episode two. Mm-hmm. I like um, that he takes the demigods seriously. Yes. I think. And like, he knows what they can handle, but he doesn't. I mean, we'll, we talked about the combat exercise, right? Like. Basically, Mm -hmm. there's monsters in the woods and everyone's in teams of two. You have to get these prizes from the monsters and or like these these they're they're like tokens or trophies or something, right? It almost feels more playful than any other event other than Capture the Flag that we have seen at Camp Half-Blood. But it is also a way of like he knows it's dangerous, obviously. It's not just a fun Mm -hmm. little scavenger hunt in the woods. There's clearly deadly monsters around. Right. But Quintus knows that the demigods can handle it. He doesn't baby them, but he also doesn't, like, force them to do more than he knows that they're capable of. Correct. So, I I, I like him. I like the way he interacts with the characters, Um, even if he seems pretty sus. Mm-hmm. Quintus yeah. is one of the few good adults at camp. The list of good adults in the series in general is, like, pretty short. Let's be real. Sally Jackson. Paul Paul. (laughs) Blofus. Kind of Quintus. Kind of Quintus. Kind of Chiron. Kind of Dionysus. Heavy emphasis. He's I Heavy emphasis on the kind of. Okay. Especially at the end of this book and in the next book. You're getting ahead of yourself. I know. That's why most of my thoughts for Dionysus are the end of this book and the next book. Which mm-hmm. I've been saying all season. Yes. Everyone's just hanging on to Rachel's every word waiting for her verdict <laughs> on Dionysus. <laughs> well, uh, I do like Clarice as of this book. So, like, yes. at least we got that going for us. I'm so excited to talk about Clarice in the second part, too. Um but, but yeah, back to Percy. Percy. Back to Percy. Um, one of the things that stuck out to me that he says to um, Briaris, um, so the hundred-handed ones have a hundred hands. They are monsters who have a hundred hands. It's mm-hmm. not that difficult. Um, but he is the last of his kind. And Tyson's like, you guys were like so amazing. You could move mountains. Like all of the Cyclopes really look up to you. And Briars is just like, yeah, well, I got captured and all of my brethren are gone and I'm just going to sit here and mope. And mm-hmm. even though Tyson risks his life to save him, Briars is still like, yeah, no, I'm good and kind of wanders off on his own. And Tyson is heartbroken. Like Tyson has met his hero, one of his heroes, and has been so sorely disappointed. And I'm going to talk more about Tyson later. Percy says, maybe that's why the mo- Maybe that's why monsters fade. Maybe it's not about what the mortals believe. Maybe it's because you give up on yourself. And I... Because there's a lot about that going on here, right? We've got Briaris. We've got Pan later on. And, like, is Pan really alive? Is he still exist? Like, the mortals don't seem to believe in him anymore. So, like, could he still be around? All these questions that we're asking about that. Yeah. 
but it also kind of come like circles back around to why are they actually fighting this war between Mm -hmm. camp half-blood and luke essentially it's like when one of them or one of the demigods stops believing in themselves or their ability to fulfill whatever prophecy or whatever job they are meant to fulfill like once they stop believing in themselves to be able to do that they are going to start losing yeah i mean in a sense percy's like i don't have the luxury to not believe in myself or my fellow demigods like if i stop that i will die and my friends will die and i cannot allow that to happen but that isn't to say that percy doesn't doubt himself oh yeah he does doubt himself quite a lot but he doesn't have the option to not try. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And Which, my last little point. Go I was going to say leads really well into the next point. <laughs> my last little point about Percy, um, for now at least, is his encounter with the Naiad mm-hmm. at um, Triple G Ranch. Um, so Percy is tasked with cleaning out the stables of the man-eating horses. And even Percy's like, yeah, I'm a son of Poseidon. Horses like me. He walks towards the horses and they're like, yeah, we're going to eat you. Because he can hear them talking. And he's like, hmm, okay, this is going to be more difficult than I thought. So the first thing he does is he goes down to the river and he's like, hey, maybe I can redirect the river up to the stables. And the naiad of the river is like, oh, no, you don't. You are not coming anywhere near my river. You are going to pollute it with all of this gunk and I will not be having it. Mm-hmm. And Percy thinks about it for a minute. And he's like, well, like, I mean, I guess I could force the issue and like take control of the river without her permission. Like he, he acknowledges that that is an option. He's like, that's what, that's what a, that's what one of the heroes of old would probably do. And then he's like, man, I don't want to be a bully. He notices that the Naiad is afraid of him and he's like yeah wouldn't that be typical of a son of poseidon just throwing his weight around and stuff i don't want to be like that he makes that choice Mm -hmm. he's and i think the naiad thinks he's going to do that for a minute and then he's just kind of sits down he's like no you win you're right it's your river i'm not going to do this and she's like really he's like yeah (laughs) she is so shocked by him not just like using force and but Percy just kind of sits there dejected because he says I don't know how I'm going to do this because all of my friends are going to die if I if I don't accomplish this task Mm -hmm. and Percy's choice to not use violence is rewarded because the naiad gives him sort of a helpful hint tip um clue clue yeah with um the fossilized fossilized seashells right yeah and you know there used to be an ocean here there used to be a whole body of water here and now it's gone because the earth has changed but you're the son of poseidon surely you can work something out with that and percy does he's able to summon the sea from the middle of this ranch a landlocked area Mm -hmm. and he's able to accomplish his task and save his friends when I first read this book, do you remember me talking to you about this scene? I don't, actually. So this, I think, was my single most favorite scene from this entire book. Minus maybe a scene with Nico. Because really? this, Yes, because this scene reads so... Percy is having a moment of having everything that he has thought checked because he is always talking about, Oh, the heroes of old, or, you know, he's like, Oh, I want to be like Hercules or while he doesn't maybe do that now, he, he would have done that in the past books. He, I mean, he's been like that in the lightning thief and sea of monsters. And even Mm -hmm. a little bit in the Titans curse, like, be Like Hercules, be like Perseus, be like Theseus, be like whoever else. But this is the first time I think he's consciously made the observation of how continuously harmful those heroes have been. And this is one of the first times where he has consciously said, I'm not going to be one of those heroes. And this scene reads so much like somebody who has been assaulted in the past, right? Like the Naiad knows what it's like to be abused. 
uh, be it pollution, be it any other form of abuse. Mm-hmm. And Percy recognizes that and he's like, Mm-mm, I'm I'm going to be a cycle breaker. Right. And I think that is one of the biggest things that this entire series is about is that you are capable of breaking any cycle that is thrown at you so long as you are making conscious decisions to do that. Mm hmm. I love this um, scene. <laughs> I'll talk more about it in part two, but I'll just say in, in the second half of this book, there's a character who says something to the, something to the effect of, of I can't save you. You have to be your own salvation mm-hmm. basically. Um, and I think that kind of, that kind of works here too. Like you have to break the cycle on your own. Like, yeah, you're a kid. You shouldn't have this pressure on it, but you have the opportunity to change the cycle of violence Mm -hmm. So why shouldn't you take it? Right. Right. And, and Percy is doing a really good job of learning from his own mistakes, but also learning from the mistakes of other people. Mm -hmm. Whether those other people be figures from the past or even peers that he has seen. Cause like being one of the biggest ones, mm -hmm. Luke would not have hesitated. No, not at all. obviously Luke doesn't have the water manipulation ability that Percy has, but like if Luke were in Percy's shoes, Luke would not have hesitated. He would have just been like, sorry, sacrifices need to be made. And maybe the Luke who first arrived at camp half blood would have, but not the Luke that we see at this. Not the Luke we see. No, no, absolutely not. He, he wouldn't have even thought about it. He would have just done it. He would not have talked Mm -hmm. to the Nyad. Yeah. Exactly. So it's nice to see that because when we read the Titans curse, we talked about how that book is very much about what kind of hero do you want to be Mm -hmm. or what makes a good hero. And we kind of see that we saw it come to fruition at the end of the Titans curse, but here we sort of see it come full circle we see that that process continue where percy is applying like i know what being a hero means Mm -hmm. and i'm going to continually apply that to how i act and how i treat others right and and he does a consistent job of it Mm -hmm. do you have anything else to say about percy rachel not for this half of the book okay well let's talk about annabeth then for a little bit okay You're just going along with it? I love Annabeth in this book. Yes. Annabeth gets to lead her own quest, and she has been wanting to do this since she was a kid. It's been like eight years. Yeah. And she is so excited and so terrified. Okay, but wouldn't you be? (laughs) Oh, yeah, absolutely. I am not judging her. Like, she is braver than I will ever be. I'm going to be real with you here. She is certainly braver than I was at age 15, and she is braver than I am at age whatever I am now. Not so hot take. Uh, Annabeth is braver than Luke ever would have been. For sure. That's why I said not so hot take. It's a, it's a lukewarm take. It is a lukewarm take. I've certainly made that joke on this podcast before. <laughs> We've made it, I think, in every episode. Somebody at home needs to be keeping a counter and um, <laughs> let us know. So what do you want to say about um, Annabeth, Maggie? I have a whole rant about like her incident with the Sphinx. But before I get to that, Clarice and Annabeth have been working together on stuff like in the background. We don't see it happening as much on page, but like they get to camp and Annabeth is like, I need to go check with Clarice on something. And Percy's like, uh, What? since when are you and Clarice like buddies and she's like you know since whenever and she just kind of goes away and Percy's like what's going on honestly it's a very cousin type move to be like I hate you and I'm going to fight you the entire time but Mm -hmm. also like let's go work on this thing together yeah so they've been investigating the labyrinths together um Mm -hmm. because Clarice actually discovered part of it um back in her hometown and there's a whole thing with um, another demigod who was going through it, who was on Luke's side and then came back. And 
Clarice tried to destroy the entrance to the labyrinth and it didn't work out. So now she and Annabeth have been investigating it together because Clarice has the experience and Annabeth has the research and the connection to it because it's an architectural, right. it's Annabeth's special interest. Right. And we love that for her. And we love that for her. Um, should I share my little, like, silly little hot take about the Percy Jackson show? It's not really a hot take. Yes. It's the thing I was telling you earlier. That's so not descriptive. Just say it. <laughs> um, based on this, I know it probably won't happen, but what I would really like to see is Annabeth and Clarice be on more, like, yes. good terms in the Percy Jackson Disney Plus series. Um, yes. For a lot of reasons, but I think it would be nice to see at least be, like, friendly towards each other, even if they're not, like, besties or anything. Because mm-hmm. um, I think it would be really nice to see that. But also, I think it would be hilarious um, if Annabeth and Clarice are, like, friends. and But Clarice just still hates Percy's guts. 100%. Like, I think it would be hysterical. And Annabeth is like, you know, Clarice is really nice when you get to know her. And Percy's like, she tried to, like, prank. She tried to drown me on my first day at camp. She has tried to kill me. Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Um, but I also like the idea of Clarice looking at Annabeth and you're like, and she's like, him? You're really going to pick him? <laughs> Head canoon? Mm-hmm. Percy and Annabeth getting married, right? Mm-hmm. We all know that Percy's best man is going to be Grover with the mm-hmm. very next person being Tyson. Like, that is just Obviously. Fact, right? Annabeth's maid of honor, matron of honor, is going to be Clarice. I like it. It it has to be, right? Like, who else would it be? I mean, Chiron. it could be Talia, but like... <laughs> <Chiron>. <laughs> okay, but no, Chiron would probably be marrying Percy and Annabeth, so, okay, I wouldn't accept He's Talia. the officiant. Okay, but no, it's not going to be Talia, because it would look... Weird to have, um, like a six, four, 15, 16 year old standing next to a however old they are when they get married. Rachel, do we really think anyone who's attending their wedding doesn't know who Talia is? You know, I could see her stepmom throwing a hissy fit. I feel like her stepmom would come around. Maybe the lady Artemis wouldn't let Talia be in a wedding. Maybe she has two maids of honor. I don't know, man. <laughs> I'm just saying, I can see it happening. Being oh, for sure. like Clarice on Annabeth's side, and Clarice just like staring down Percy the entire time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> what is the line that they say during weddings? Like, if anyone has any objections or whatever, speak now or forever hold your peace. Yeah. <laughs> Clarice stands up. Chris just comes up and is like, no. No. <laughs> Sit down. <laughs> if you're at home and you don't know who Chris is yet, don't worry. We'll talk about him another time. Um, My youngest brother really wanted to object at my sister's wedding. I think that this next part is going to send us both into a rampage. Oh, yeah. Oh, I've got a rampage. So Clarice and Annabeth working together. Love them. Um, Then Annabeth encounters the Sphinx. And the Sphinx is supposed to give riddles. And the way you... You, you pass the Sphinx by solving the riddle. And Annabeth's like, don't worry, guys. I got this. I know what, he, what the Sphinx is going to ask. I know what the answer is. We'll get out here unscathed. Annabeth shows up and she is given a Scantron to take. Mm-hmm. And if you don't know what a Scantron is, it's one of those sheets that has all the bubbles and you fill them in with your pencil. They're for standardized tests. I say also that for all of the homeschoolers in the audience. Yes, for our homeschoolers. For the homeschoolers out there, I I was one of you once. I know your I, I I know what it's like when people talk about school things, and you're like, I don't know what the heck that means. Although you're you probably can't say heck, so just cut that part out. Don't know what it means. <laughs> so basically, the Sphinx starts asking her not riddles, but like factual questions, and Annabeth mm-hmm. knows all the answers because Annabeth is very smart. But Annabeth starts protesting. She's like, wait, this isn't how it's supposed to be. You're supposed to ask me other things. And 
the Sphinx is like, no, 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 this is the best way to track knowledge and wisdom and blah, blah, blah. And Annabeth keeps protesting against it to the point where the Sphinx decides, okay, you know what? If you don't like my tests, then I'm going to eat you. Mm -hmm. And they fight the Sphinx and have to escape. Annabeth has been failed by the education system just as much as Percy has, just in a different way. So, like, Percy has failed out of schools and he's had issues, like, behavior quote-unquote behavioral issues Mm -hmm. um, in schools and he's gotten kicked out at six schools in six years and all those things. Um, But Annabeth clearly loves learning and she, but she grasps concepts much more quickly than her peers do. Like, you explain this to her once and she's like, I got this. I know this knowledge now. Mm -hmm. And so she isn't always engaged in learning, I think, in the same way, like, like, she gets it, and then everyone else is still, like, learning the process. She's like, well, now, now what I'm supposed to do, like, I, I understand this. I don't need any more practice or whatever. So Annabeth always needs – Annabeth has always needed more challenge than I think she's been given. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of – I think that's sort of how her – because Annabeth has ADHD like the other demigods do. And I think that's – it, one of the ways in which her ADHD manifests. For Am sure. I correct in saying that? Just kind of off mic yes. a little bit. Like that's yeah. that's a thing, right? I'm not just making yes. that up in my head. <laughs> no. So like for Percy, academics just aren't engaging at all. Like he he will do it, but it's not like <sighs> I'm trying to think of the right word. Like it's just not in, it, it, it's not engaging it's not enough for him. It's not engaging so. in the way of this is a more challenging thing for me that I don't mm-hmm. want to use my brain power on. Whereas with yeah. Annabeth, it is not challenging enough. So she doesn't want to waste any brain power on doing something that won't be satisfying. Right. And so Percy has trouble and gets frustrated and he has to work really hard just to get by. Mm-hmm. Whereas with Annabeth, it's a breeze. It's not a challenge. But because it is not a challenge, it's not engaging. Yes. Um, because it's not a challenge, it's not engaging. So it, it's almost like too little intellectual stimulation. It's too easy. And they're kind of, it, it's kind of two sides of the same coin. Um, mm-hmm. And both are ways in which ADHD and other both are ways in which ADHD manifests in students, especially. And I just think it's interesting because we talk, because we're in Percy's head, we talk a lot about how his neurodivergence and ADHD manifests because he's experiencing it firsthand. Right. Right. But we only see it happening with Annabeth, like through Percy's perspective. So I don't think, I don't know if Percy always picks up on it all the time. Like, Annabeth will have struggle spelling something and Percy could be like, oh yeah, she's dyslexic like I am. Um, and like same same sort of thing here. Percy doesn't explicitly acknowledge it, but like it's one of those instances where we get to see like, oh yeah, Annabeth has also struggled with school in a different way than Percy has, but she has still struggled and has still been failed by the school system that she's living in. Right. Mm-hmm. Sorry, that was a lot of words. In addition to everything you have said, can I now go on my spiel? Oh, yeah. Okay. So, first of all, the Sphinx, terrible way to test anybody, just in general speaking terms. Also, she's not asking multiple choice questions. So, like, why are you giving Annabeth a Scantron if it's not a multiple choice test? Like, come on. Come on, Rick. Like, get with your own program here, my dude. And then... And then, like... Yes, this is really frustrating for Annabeth because it's not testing her in a way that really needs to be tested. Additionally, like I this is this is a hot take. This is a this might be a piping hot take actually. Yes. Annabeth I think would do really well in an English literature class. Because I can get behind that. It's an application of skills. Right. And not an. How do I want to say this? Not a. You're not reciting facts in an English class. You are applying skills. Right. So a lot of times people who are actually really interested in STEM 
science, technology, engineering, and mathematics are not the strongest writers or readers because they see it as something that is super subjective all the time. And yes, English is subjective, but in the way that there is a correct answer, depending on how you defend your answer. It's not so much that there's a correct answer. It's there's a correct way to, everything is a correct answer as long as you defend it strongly enough. Yes. And as long as your logic is sound, you are going to be correct. And I Mm -hmm. think that part of English, Annabeth would find really engaging. Yes. And I think she would also really love linguistics, which is ironic mm-hmm. because Percy and Annabeth, like all of the other demigods, are dyslex- dyslexic. Are dyslexic. <laughs> <laughs> Some of my favorite students have actually been my students with dyslexia. Really? Yeah. But I don't have favorite students. Not at all. No. You do Not have students all. who listen to our podcast. Exactly. Hello, students who listen to our podcast. They're my favorites. They are your fans. They do not tell me that they like me on the podcast. They just tell me that they like you on the podcast. I feel like I need to come and visit and just shatter their illusions of who I am because I'm less (laughs) awesome in person. (laughs) Not true. Not true at all. Um, Is there anything else you want to say about Annabeth? All right, so we've talked about Percy and Annabeth, so why don't we talk about their relationship a little bit, because there is a lot going on in this book. That might be an understatement. Yeah, it might be an understatement. Things are kind of tense. (laughs) (laughs) Like, in a way that they haven't been before between them. Um, Mm -hmm. And it's partly because they're both kind of working through their own stuff at the moment, Correct. But it's also, it's kind of awkward to watch. <laughs> y- yeah, that, Not that is Not awkward fair. like I don't like it, just awkward as in like, I don't know how to say it. See, to me, it's just like watching any of the kids in my classroom talking to their crush and mm. one of them being totally oblivious, which is exactly what is happening here. But like, I see it play out pretty much every day. <laughs> Like, that's just a fact of my life at this point. Mm-hmm. But, like, yeah, it is very awkward to watch for when you're not used to watching it. Right. It's just kind of like, oh, you guys, like, clearly you both like each other, but nobody's saying anything, and it's just awkward. Correct. Like, you want to do something about it, but you can't. Correct. And then there's all kinds of other things that come into play in the book. It's it's a whole right mess. 100%. Um, but even in the middle of that, they're still supportive of each other and they're for each other when it counts. Mm-hmm. Um, and it counts all the time, let's be real. But like when especially it is necessary, they both Percy and Annabeth are able to put aside their tension, I guess is for lack of a better term, and support the other person when it's needed so like even though annabeth and percy are like a little bit on uh, they're having they're having a moment when annabeth is selected for to lead this quest she still chooses percy and percy accepts without hesitation like of course i'm going to do this with you you don't even have to ask yes and i think that speaks to the really strong um foundation of their relationship where, like, they have known each other for years, and even though their things aren't as good as they would like them to be right now, that doesn't mean that their care for each other has changed. Correct. Yeah. They're, they're, they're really trying. They are really trying, and they're doing okay. You know what? They're, like, fif- they're 15, right, in this book? 15? Yes. Yeah. Percy so, like, turns 15 at the end of this book. Right. So they're 14. They're like 14 and 15 because Annabeth's birthday is earlier than Percy's. Is it really? Yeah, it's in like July. How did I not know this? It's not in these books. It's mentioned in the Heroes of Olympus. Okay, that makes me feel better then. That makes me feel Um, better. I'm pretty sure it's like June or July. It's in the summer, but it's not 
August. Gotcha. So that leaves us with two options. Well, she could also be like an entire year younger. This is also true. I don't think that's the case, though. Gotcha. Um, I mean, I could be totally wrong. I don't think I have enough information to prove or disprove that. It's just mm-hmm. my personal preference. I think that's fair. But yeah. So like, I just love the little moments between the two of them. Like, Annabeth breaking the rules to come sit down at Percy's table during dinner time so that they can like discuss the labyrinth. And Percy's like, everyone is staring at us and Annabeth is right next to me. And I mean, like, she is right next to me. Yeah. Um, and everybody's but he's also looking like, at me. Mm-hmm. But he's also kind of like, I like that she broke the rules to sit next to me. Yeah. And then when the two of them get chosen to team up, so the demigods are put in teams of two for this combat exercise that Quintus has them do. Um, and when he announces that Percy and Annabeth are going to be together, um, it, I- I'll just read the quote. Um, nice, I grinned at Annabeth. Your armor is crooked was her only comment, and she redid my straps for me. And just like, Percy is very affirming with his words. Oh, yeah. And Annabeth is very affirming with her actions and like through physical touch as well. Oh, 100%. And um, it's it's ahead. very much like their types of love languages. Like Annabeth isn't going to come out and say like, oh, I think you're good at this. Like, no, she's going to probably criticize you, but because mm-hmm. she wants you to do better. So she is fixing right. his armor. And I think that that's a really sweet touch. Mm hmm. And they always know how to fight alongside each other um, and reassure each other when it's necessary. Like when they're trapped in the labyrinth and it's dark and they don't know how they're going to get back out. Mm -hmm. Like they reach towards each other and it's like, it is good to know that there is another human down here with me. Or like when Annabeth is really distressed about leading her first quest and Percy just continually reaffirms her, like, you're going to do great. You will, You've been training for this your whole life. There is no one else better suited for this task than you. Right. It's just, I I really appreciate them. And they're they're working through their issues, but that doesn't diminish their relationship, really. Correct. They are developmentally where they are supposed to be. And it's refreshing Mm -hmm. to see. Yes. You can tell that the person who wrote these books worked with people of this age. Oh, 100%. 100%. More than just, like, his children. <laughs> right, right, right. Because Rick Riordan was a teacher before he was a best-selling author. Correct. Which is just, like, goals right there. Mm-hmm. Rachel's aspirations. Yes. <laughs> But I think we need to talk a little bit about page 203, which is right before our cutoff in the middle of this book. Do you have your copy of the book there, Rachel? Yes, I have my copy of the book. I wasn't being cynical. I was just asking. I didn't know if you had it. I have not opened it. (laughs) Well, you didn't have to admit that on the air. I know, but I feel like I did. So for context, this is when Annabeth and Percy are at Mount St. Helens and they're being surrounded and they're trying to find a way to escape. And Percy's telling Annabeth that she needs to like put on your invisibility cap and get the heck out of here. Um, And they're arguing about it, of course, as they always do. Uh, Percy says, put your cap back on. I said, get out. What? Annabeth shrieked. No, I'm not leaving you. I've got a plan. I'll distract them. You can use the metal spider. Maybe it'll lead you back to Hephaestus. You have to tell him what's going on. But you'll be killed. I'll be fine. Besides, we've got no choice. Annabeth glared at me like she was going to punch me. And then she did something that surprised me even more. She kissed me. Be careful, seaweed brain. She put on her hat and vanished. I probably would have sat there for the rest of the day staring at the lava and trying to remember what my name was, but the sea demons jarred me back to reality. (laughs) 
and that's when Percy like has his final face off with the monsters and he explodes the volcano and gets blown himself into oblivion. Um, but like, I know we talk a lot about stuff that happens in the next book, like as terms of like top tier, like Percy Annabeth moments, Persebeth moments, if you will. Um, but I really like this scene too. And it also hurts a lot because Annabeth realizes there is a very strong chance that she will not see Percy again after this. Yes. Like, this is the most danger they have ever been in. They have faced a lot of nonsense. Like, she's been kidnapped by Titans. They faced off against the Sirens in Sea of Monsters. There was Medusa in book one. And the there's there's so many things that have happened. And this is the one where it's like, oh, no. I Like, reality is hitting both of them like a truck. Oh, yeah. And that's probably even an understatement. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know if you had anything else to say about that, but I feel like that is a very important scene no i 100 percent agree i i think it is the first moment where we as the readers get an overt oh they're going to be love interest moments mm-hmm. like before it was just kind of like okay it's an 11 year old it's a 12 year old like they're just trying to figure things out and then at this point they're 14 15 and it's like oh 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 <laughs> yeah exactly and it's it's a very cute and like pure moment of like neither of them really knowing what's going on yeah percy really doesn't know what's going on he's just kind of like uh and he's like oh right i'm dying right (laughs) which honestly mood agreed i really like percy and annabeth in sea of monsters i really like their friendship development in that book but i also really like them in this book and just seeing them work through the sort of awkwardness of being teenagers who like are really good friends and might start to feel like maybe things are more than friends and working yes. through those feelings in real time as it as it could be i guess hardcore agree yeah do you have anything else to say about percy and annabeth no i just really like them me too i want what they have Let's talk about the other two members of our... Well, actually, before we get to them, let's talk, since we're already talking about Rachel in the book, let's talk about Rachel in the book just briefly, because she's only here for, like, a chapter and a half, if that. Yeah, she's, she's like, a hot second in this first half. Yeah, she plays... She will reappear later on in the second half of the book, but we haven't gotten to that yet. So I just wanted to make one note that I... A note that I noticed about her, yep. Um... A comment a thought that i had while reading this um is it something you believe you know what stop that <laughs> for anyone who is not in my immediately immediate family listening to this, immediately family immediately family uh we were playing clue last night and i was very pedantic about the language use <laughs> very pedantic But please continue, Maggie. Well, now I lost my train of thought. It's all your fault. I'm so sorry. It was funny, though. Percy and Rachel sort of run into each other again at the school that they are both apparently going to attend in the coming fall. It's the summer (laughs) orientation session. Rachel's like, uh, there's something weird going on over there. We should run. And Percy's like, hmm, okay. So then they end up talking and she says... She says, like, you said something to me when I saw you at the Hoover Dam. You called me a mortal like you're not. And Percy's like, uh, crap. (laughs) Like, that's kind of his internal monologue in this scene. Uh, But he says, he's like, what was I thinking? I could never explain. I shouldn't even try. And then Rachel says, tell me, you know what it means? All these horrible things I see? And Percy's like, well, you know, there's like those Greek myths and there's gods and they're real. He kind of gives her a crash course in um, being a demigod. Yep. And Rachel's like, I knew it. And Percy's like, what? (laughs) What do you mean you knew it? So. And then Rachel goes on to say, you don't know how hard it's been, she said. For years, I thought I was going crazy. I couldn't tell anybody. I couldn't. And then her she kind of stops herself there. But like. I just think about Rachel, like, 
we find out later that she is mortal. Like, she is a human being. She is not a demigod. But mm-hmm. she's able to see through the mist in a way that most mortals cannot. Um, similar in the way that we know that Sally Jackson can see through the mist, Rachel Rachel has a much clearer sight even than Sally. Yes. So, anyway, it's just interesting. Like, Rachel is so desperate for someone who understands what she's seeing and the pain that it's causing her. Like, she has yeah. seen some weird stuff. And she's like, if I say this to anybody, they're going to think I've lost my marbles. And perhaps fairly so, but I think that's kind of the first glimpse we get of her and how just lonely she is, both Mm -hmm. like in terms of we don't really see her with any other friends. And to be fair, we don't see her much at all, but she is sort of separate in the sense that (sighs) I can't think of a better, like she is not like her peers and she kind of separates herself from them i'm not like other girls but Look, i was trying to find I, a well, way to I, i'm gonna pull an analogy because she's like i'm not mm-hmm. like other girls in the same way percy is not i'm or not all men right in the same way that percy is not like other heroes right yeah yeah so yeah i just i just like that little note where we get to see a little bit of we only saw a glimpse of her in the Titan's curse and we were all just like, huh, that was weird. And then she came back and we get to see a little bit more about her and what she is going through. And we'll get to see more of that in the second half of the book. But I just wanted to mention that here. Yes. I like Rachel. Rachel. is one of my favorite characters. And, not and you're just not just saying that name. because you're Rachel. Right. I did not particularly like her my first read until I got to the end of the series. I think that's fair. She has some evasiveness and she's a little bit rough around the edges, sort of in the same way that Annabeth is kind of rough around the edges in The Lightning Thief. Yes. Um, They are actually more similar than I think either of them would care to admit. They are similar in the way Percy and Talia are similar. Yes, exactly. So they butt heads, but in reality, everybody's like, but you're like the same person. Yes. And everyone's like, what are you guys? (laughs) Anyway, we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves. Like, you would be besties if you didn't hate each other. Right. So figure out your own crap, dude. Mm Mm-hmm. But let's talk about the other two members of our questing team. And starting with Tyson... I love Tyson. Tyson comes back just in time for cabin cleanup at Camp Half-Blood. Because Percy is scrambling. He's like, I'm the only person who can clean up this cabin. And I'm going to end up on like bathroom cleaning duty for the rest of the month. But when he gets there, Tyson is already there. And he's finished cleaning up. He's putting out the finishing touches for cabin inspection. And just one of the first things that I really like is... I'll read you this quote from page 34. On the windowsills, Tyson had set out water-filled vases with sea anemones and strange glowing strange glowing plants from the bottom of the ocean, more beautiful than any flower bouquets the Demeter kids could whip up. And just like how Tyson is known for being big and like being work being working, yep, and working in the forges and like you don't think of a cyclops for their delicateness. Right. But Tyson is so delicate here and like puts the nice finishing touches out and it it just makes my heart whole. And the fact that he thought of that and was like, Oh, this would be really pretty. Like he has a very keen aesthetic sense, I think actually. Oh yes. I mean, if you think about the shield that he made for Percy with all of the artwork hammered into it, of like their adventures Mm -hmm. incredible tyson deserves so much more like yes he deserves the world i love him he does oh no are you gonna cry i mean yeah because tyson can't go to elysium he's a monster we don't need to talk about it right now (laughs) maggie Rachel, we don't need to talk about it right now. He is alive and well. But he's gonna die at some point. Everybody has to die. Well, not in the books. 
It's fine. It's fine. Are you sure it's fine? Yes. I don't like it when my brain thinks. <laughs> what a mood. <laughs> and I know we already know this about Tyson, but he is so brave in this book. Like, he continually does things to do whatever he can to protect his friends, even when Percy feels like he should be the one protecting Tyson. Like, especially at Alcatraz, where Tyson meets one of his heroes, is consequently completely disappointed by him, still goes back to make sure, like, Briaris can get out of Alcatraz. And Percy's like, I'm going to, I'm waiting for you. Like, I, we are going to leave together. And Tyson says, go, brother, I will meet you inside. And fortunately, Tyson does make it, or else I would have lost my mind. But... I would not forgive Rick. That is an unforgivable sin right there. It is an unforgivable sin. You are correct. When they split up to go, um, when they split up to go their separate ways, like when Grover and Tyson go to find Pan and Percy and Annabeth go to Mount St. Helens, they've just had this long conversation with Hephaestus where Hephaestus is like, yeah, you can't trust anybody. You know, my mother, Hera, she threw me off a freaking mountain. Yep. And he warns Tyson too. He's like, Hey, you're a Cyclops. Like you're pretty good with your hands, but like, be careful around these humans and demigods and stuff like that. Eh -eh. But Grover really wants to follow this sense of this sense that he has that pan is nearby. But, and everyone's like, Grover, you can't just go by yourself. And, but Annabeth needs to lead her quest. And Percy really wants to go with her. And so Tyson volunteers. He says, I'll go with Grover. And Percy's like, are you sure? And Tyson says, I am not like Hephaestus. I trust friends. And it's just, it kills me. It's worth noting that up until this point, Tyson and Grover don't dislike each other, but they have a hard time getting along. Yes. Because Grover is afraid of most things. Yes. Grover is easily intimidated, even though Tyson is like the softest boy. And Tyson just gets a little antsy around Grover. But they still go on this part of the quest together. And Tyson chooses to do that. And that makes that makes me happy. It's just such a wholesome little... Like, both of them are deciding to take this little bit of leap of faith. Because they both trust Percy. And Tyson is just willing to trust pretty much anyone. Right. But he has been burned in the past, so I think he's learning that, oh, maybe I shouldn't trust everyone. Mm -hmm. But he does trust Percy, he does trust Annabeth, and he does trust Grover. Yeah, he knows Percy is his number one, right? Percy is his Oh yeah, Percy is his ride, ride or die. And he knows who, per who Percy's people are. Yes. He knows, like, even if Grover isn't my, like, as you put it, ride or die, like, he's still one of Percy's people, and therefore I can trust him. Yes. I love Tyson. I also love Tyson. I have loved Tyson since Sea of Monsters the first time I read it. I know. Um, and Grover is also a member of this quest. There's not a whole lot that goes on with him in this part of the book. I mean, he has his meeting with the Council of Cloven Elders or whatever, and they're like, hey, um, you need to find Pan by this day or, or we are revoking your searcher's license. No ifs, ands, or buts. Right. And so that is partly why Grover goes on this quest with them, because he thinks it's his best chance at finding Pan. Um, right. I do think he, so he's kind of in some emotional turmoil here because this has been his life's work. Oh, yeah. But he's also braver that he makes himself out to be, I think. Mm -hmm. He does not like underground spaces like at all and especially not since he was held captive by the cyclops on in sea of monsters right by right. polyphemus and even though he knows that the chances of finding pan are pretty slim he is still like holding on to the smallest shred of hope which some people might be like that's a little too optimistic for me but also that is what he has and he is going to hold on to that even he is going to hold on to that up until there is a very clear reason not to Oh, I'm sure we'll have more to say about Grover in part two, but do you have anything else to say about him now? He also has a girlfriend. Her name is Juniper. 
I do love Juniper. <laughs> She's a sweetheart. Mm-hmm. She is a dryad, I think is the word for it. She is a tree yes. spirit. Hence Juniper, obviously. I, I am I'm putting us back on the clock. Okay. Sorry, I was sending Rachel tweets about a movie that doesn't exist. Indeed. If you know, you know. <laughs> so let's talk about Nico, everyone's favorite angry emo baby. Yes. I wrote also, that in the notes and I wasn't going to say it, but I wanted to say it. Where did you put that in the notes? At the bottom where it says Nico, comma, everyone's favorite angry emo baby. Right after Grover. Oh, it's literally attached to his name. <laughs> yes. That's why I said gotcha. Nico, comma. Gotcha. I used I'm the tracking. comma properly this time. You could <laughs> you could have also used a colon. Eh. I felt like a comma was more appropriate. We can argue. Would that you like later. me to change it to a colon, Rachel? No, because then I'll just look at it and laugh the entire time. Okay. <laughs> Rachel, why don't you start us off with Nico? Because he's your favorite. Nico is my favorite. So Nico is still just like a little baby in this book. He's like he's maybe he's 10 11, or 11 years old. Yeah. Percy even really sure so all of you people who are like rick doesn't know how old his characters are man percy doesn't even know he's not a reliable source yeah so like it uh, you know i think i kind of age nico up in my head a little bit i think i've made him like 12 but that's not the point that we're talking about at this point that is not the point we're making correct so nico is really struggling he is completely on his own he is not at camp he does not want to be at camp and he is kind of wandering around with this little ghost friend and we don't know who his ghost friend is but the ghost friend is definitely manipulating him and anyone watching from the outside can see that and it's really really hard to watch because Nico is just filled with so much anger and pain after the last book where he lost Bianca and like in his defense it has been at most like seven months right it has not been a full year since then. Not that a full year is like, okay, it's been a year. Now you're all like, you can't right. have grief anymore. That's no not more feelings for you. Right. Uh, but it has not been a long time is the point we're emphasizing right. here. And he is so little. So he is trying to raise her ghost and like bring her back to life. Right. We later find out that his friend is King Minos. And he's, and Minos and Minos is like, hey, you know, if you wanted to bring someone back from the dead, a soul for a soul, like, is a thing that can happen. But you have to have the soul of somebody who has cheated death. Mm -hmm. And so Percy sees all of this in visions and dreams that he's had throughout the beginning of the book. And weird and, Iris messages. Yes. And these weird Iris messages that he's been getting from, like, unknown sources. Where he has to pay. They are collect calls. Yes. I did not know you could have a collect call in an Iris message, but now you know. Exactly. And Percy is like, uh, he's being manipulated. I need to find him and make sure he's okay. Yes. Because even though Percy knows that Nico hates his guts because he didn't save Bianca, Percy is also really haunted by the guilt he feels over Bianca's death. Like, he he mm -hmm. did everything he felt he could to save her and still did not succeed and he not only feels guilt about like this young demigod died on her first quest which is something that could have happened to me and almost happened to me on multiple occasions but also as a result he also hurt this other young demigod and Percy just feels a lot of guilt around that. And, like, it makes sense why he does, right? Oh, yeah. But, yes, Percy is very, very concerned for Nico because if Percy fails to be the child of prophecy, it's going to be Nico. Right. Because Percy, Percy and Annabeth are the only ones who know that Nico is a son of Hades. Correct. I think a couple other the characters have suspicions i think tyson sus i think tyson finds out or percy says something to tyson and tyson he's like tyson you can't tell anybody and tyson's like i will not tell a soul he doesn't say it like that he's like mouth is sealed like the crack in the ground 
Yes. And I think Chiron has suspicions. But he doesn't know for sure. Percy and Annabeth have not told him. Correct. Intentionally have not told him. Yes. And when Percy does eventually tell Chiron, he he finds out that Chiron didn't know. For sure. Chiron had suspicions, but he didn't know for sure. Uh, But I would die for Nico. And I would kill for Nico, which is Mm -hmm. probably a more powerful statement coming from me. Yes. Percy and gang do meet Nico in this half of the book. They they meet him at the Triple G Ranch, Mm -hmm. where he's sort of maybe kind of under the quote unquote protection of the ranch owner and then there's a whole bunch of shenanigans where like they end up getting kidnapped and percy has to clean the stables and all that stuff that we talked about earlier but once that is all settled down percy says nico has been trying and trying unsuccessfully to summon bianca's spirit Mm -hmm. and then percy finally says why don't you try again with me here and nico's like why would she do it if you were here and percy kind of puts the pieces together he says i've been getting these weird iris messages and i think they're coming from your sister i think she's worried about you and asked me to come like check on you basically Mm -hmm. so they do they are able to summon bianca's spirit together and nico and bianca finally get to talk about everything and it's a really emotional scene and it's fine But there's also this sort of cycle of guilt again. Like, Bianca is feeling guilty over abandoning Nico in the Titan's Curse, which is what led to her death. Right. Like, she, that is why she stole the the figurine from the Junkyard of the Gods and summoned the automaton and it killed her. And then Percy's guilt over Bianca's death because he's, he was trying so hard to protect her is kind of what leads him to being more protective over Nico, which Nico does not want. Nico's like, no, get out of my face. Mm -hmm. But But Bianca has this like major, like pull your crap together with Nico. And she also admits her wrongdoing as well in this scene. Percy apologizes to Bianca and she says, you have nothing to apologize for Percy. I made my own choice and I don't regret it. Mm-hmm. And the first thing Bianca says to Nico is, hello, Nico, you've gotten so tall. Nico is so like, he says, why didn't you answer me sooner? I've been trying for months. And in this moment, like he has a lot of anger and he's trying to be tougher than he is. But in this moment, he is just a little kid who misses his only family. Mm-hmm. And Bianca says, I wanted you to give up. And Nico says, give up. Like, I'm trying to save you. Why would you say that? And they go on and talk and talk about this. Um, Bianca tells him, holding grudges is dangerous for a child of Hades. It is our fatal flaw. You have to forgive. You have to promise me this. Because Nico is holding his grudge against Percy, of course. And Bianca says, like, Percy can help you. And Nico, Nico is still so angry. And he's like, why are you helping Percy? Like, I'm your brother. Like, and Bianca says, like, I know you're not angry with Percy. You're angry with me. And she Mm -hmm. says, you're mad because I left you to become a hunter of Artemis. You're mad because I died and left you alone. I'm sorry for that, Nico. I truly am. But you must overcome the anger and stop blaming Percy for my choices. It will be your doom. Annabeth, she's right. Annabeth broke in. Kronos is rising, Nico. He'll twist anyone he can to his cause. I don't care about Kronos, Nico said. I just want my sister back. Honestly, what a mood. Yeah. And I like that Bianca is able to acknowledge, I I don't know, maybe some wisdom comes with death. I know that's a very crude way of saying that, but I like that Bianca acknowledges I messed up and I'm really sorry for that. But yeah, and I'm trying to do what I can to remedy that, but there's only so much I can do. Please don't let this consume you. In the same way that she let her guilt consume her, basically. Right. Her guilt is what killed her because she tried stealing from the graveyard of the gods, or the junkyard of the gods. She let her negative emotions consume her, and it was her doom. And she sees Nico walking down that same path. Right. (sighs) I'm just emotional. And this is the last time we see Bianca. Yeah. And it's I wonder 
you if wonder she's going to show up in the sun and the star i don't think so because i think she chooses um to be not reborn. reincarnation yeah is it re- is it called reincarnation she chooses to be reborn she wants yeah. to be on the isles of the blessed I would not be surprised if we did see a remnant of her that makes sense The final note that Maggie has in our notes that I think we need to highlight because it's really, really important Mm -hmm. is about Hephaestus. And Hephaestus being the first god to say that the gods can change, but he doesn't say it in a positive and enthusiastic way. Right. We've had this sort of ongoing debate in our podcast about, like, do the gods change? Can the gods change? Will the gods change? And Hephaestus is the first person to acknowledge that, yeah, gods can change, but it's not really said, like, the gods can change and be better. It's like, the gods can change and they can turn your back on you at any second and they suck. Right. But because, I would argue, because they can do something so horrible, they could also change to be better. Right. But everyone knows that changing for the worse is a whole lot easier than changing for the better. For sure. And a lot less painful for the person who is changing correct but the argument is that it is possible right exactly yeah and it is Mm -hmm. we hope for the change Mm -hmm. and we'll see how more of that comes into play later on in this book and in the next book as well especially in the next book especially especially i have a lot to say about the other other god that we interact with at the end of this book Mm -hmm. the last thing i want to say about this is sort of a bringing it all together moment um the theme of we've sort of talked a little bit about themes of the books throughout our season here i think the one of the main themes if not the main theme of the battle of the labyrinth is choice and the choices that we make and who we choose and what we choose Mm -hmm. And this is especially key for both Annabeth and for Percy. And I think I might save that discussion for after we have finished, like at the end of part two. But we do see Janice sort of mention this to Annabeth later on. Janice is a Roman god, which is surprising. Um, But Janice is the two-faced god and symbolizes choices and doorways and Things like that. So he sort of taunts Annabeth a little bit before Hera comes in and is like, get the heck out of here. It's not your time yet. Shoo. Um, and we think Hera comes with um, wisdom and help, but eh. the point being, choice is a very key thing in this book. And it comes more into play as things come together towards the end of the book. But I think we can start to see some of the threads of those themes in this part as well. I agree. And that's Battle of the Labyrinth part one. Indeed. We will be recording part two relatively soon. And then we have a bit of a break before we actually jump into the final book of Percy Jackson and the Olympians. Mm -hmm. For those of you reading along at home, we are going to be reading The Demigod Files, which is a sort of spin-off book, short story collection that takes place between Battle of the Labyrinth and The Last Olympian. So if you want to get a head start, we will be doing an episode on that. Rachel has never read any of these stories before, and I have not in a very long time. So I'm excited to talk about them with her. I've... I've bribed her by saying one of them is about Beckendorf, who is one of her favorites. And one of them giggle. (laughs) (laughs) And one of them has Nico, so it's all good. It's gonna be a grand time. But first we'll do part two of Battle of the Labyrinth in our next episode. And anything else you have to say about this, Rachel? I don't think so. I think I'll save the rest of my thoughts for part two. All right. Well, Until next time, everybody. Goodbye. Bye. If you enjoy our show, please consider leaving us a review on our website or wherever you find your podcasts. We'll see you again soon.